Okay. All right. Well, thank you to everyone uh, for joining us for the webinar today, Fundamentals of National Recreation Trails. My name is Candace Gallagher, and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 164th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. And this uh, free webinar, it's being recorded. It includes real-time closed captioning in English and also offers free learning credits. Uh, links to both the closed captioning and the learning credit quiz will be in the chat box if you don't already see them there. And attendees will receive a follow-up email from me with the recording, uh, transcript, resources slide with the presenter emails and a bunch of links, um, as well as learning credit details within two days following the webinar. And we are saving time for attendee questions at the end of the webinar, but we do welcome you to send your questions um, at any time uh, during today's presentation via the Q&A icon that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And I want to thank the partners of the webinar today. That include uh, the National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, as well as the Federal Highway Administration. And I'm excited to introduce our webinar presenters for today. We have Peter Bonzel, who is a National Trails Program Specialist with the National Park Service. We also have Matt Abel, who is the Assistant National Trail Program Manager with the U.S. Forest Service. We also have Mike Passo, Executive Director of American Trails. And finally, we have Andy Griffith, who is founder of Plum Island Outdoors, um, who has experience with designated national recreation trails. So I will now hand control over to Peter to start today's presentation. Great, thank you, Candace. <clears throat> Uh, welcome everyone to our presentation today, uh, National Recreation Trails, Preserving and Celebrating Our Nation's Pathways. And to get us started, uh, we'll have Matt talk over a little bit of background. All right. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> so yeah, the, what is a National rec Recreation Trail? Um, back in 1968, the National Trail System Act um, created what we know as national recreation trails. And these have to be existing land or water-based trails. Key there is existing. So you can't propose a, a proposed trail for an NRT. It has to already be on the ground. Um, but the idea is to provide close to home recreational opportunities on all kinds of land, including federal, state, tribal, and local lands, um, and connect to the national trail system, trail network. Uh, it's recognized and designated by either the Secretary of Interior or the Secretary of Agriculture. So interiors over BLM, Park Service, actually anything other than the Forest Service, which is under the Secretary of Agriculture. Next slide. So why NRTs? Um, you know, the idea behind NRTs was uh, to elevate trails of all types uh, for all different kinds of people. So it's just a national designation that um, lets us recognize outstanding trails in both urban and rural settings um, of all different types of use, skills, physical abilities. So it's just a way for us to elevate um, trails for everybody. The idea is um, to use care of our existing trails, stimulate development of new trails throughout the US. Um, we wanna provide access to, again, both urban and rural communi communities. NRTs are a great, great way to promote that access. Um, economic development through tourism. NRTs can draw people into rural and uh, local communities and then provide healthy recreation opportunities for the American public. <clears throat> so there's all kinds of different NRTs. Um, we, like I said, cover all different uses uses, uh, including all terrain, uh, all terrains, all settings, um, you know, equestrian, hiking, horseback, um, that's equestrian, ATV, UTV, all sorts of things can be designated, including water trails uh, for NRTs. Um, there's currently 1,300 NRTs or over 1,300s. Uh, we cover all 50 states, including the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Um, you can see the list here on the right shows you some of the very first NRTs. The first one was Shakaloe Trail back uh, in 1969 in Missouri. And then some of the newest ones that were just designated in the last couple of years, 
or actually that's a list of how many have been designated the last few years. I think that'll pass it over to Peter. Great, thank you, Matt. So let's start off by going, what makes a, a trail eligible for NRT designation? Uh, first of all, it has to be a trail. So a trail is a travel way established either through construction or use and is passable by at least one or more of the following, including but not limited to foot traffic, uh, stock, equestrian, watercrafts, bicycles, uh, wheelchairs, cross-country skis, off-road recreation vehicles, uh, uh, like motorcycles and snowmobiles, ATVs, uh, four-wheel drive vehicles. Uh, keep in mind that roads and highways that are suitable for passenger car travel are not eligible for NRT designation. Next slide, please. So a trail, it must be open to public use, has no gaps, and must be designated, constructed, and maintained according to best management practices in keeping with anticipated use. Uh, keep in mind trails that demonstrate these state-of-the-art design and management practices are especially encouraged to apply for NRT designation as they really show these high caliber trails uh, across the country. Next. A uh, trail is in compliance with all apl applicable land use plans and environmental laws. So any uh, NEPA or environmental assessments, um, whatever laws may be applicable on your land, they must be addressed with those. Next slide. Uh, as, Matt, as Matt stated in the beginning, uh, the trail is in existence and will be available for public use for at least 10 years. So again, um, a planned trail is not eligible. Uh, the trail has to be built, again, have no gaps. Um, all public and private property owners of the trail lands or waters have been notified and have given their written consent and support for the designation. And we'll touch a little bit more on this uh, later in the presentation in the frequency as frequently asked questions. Uh, trails on state, local, local government, or private land pretty much any lands other than federal government must have a letter of support from the appropriate traits state trail administrator. And if anyone's interested on who they may be, uh, you can find uh, the contact information for your state trail administrator on American Trails website. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike to discuss the benefits of NRT designation. All right, thanks, Peter. So, I wanted to start. My name is Mike Passo. I'm the executive director of American Trails, and I'm, I'm we we tend to manage the uh, National Recreational Trails database in partnership with our federal partners. So that's why we're coming in. And I wanted to just take a second to to kind of tell you what I think about the NRTs and why I think they're super valuable. And then we'll go into some of the very kind of more tangible benefits, but. To me, you know, we have this great national trail system, one of a kind in the world. Um, it's really well maintained, and the and the diamonds of those are the scenic and historic trails. And I see the the national recreational trails as kind of the more dynamic um, and changing and growing element of the national trail systems. You know, we haven't added a national scenic trail for a long time, or a, historic trail you know it takes a lot to get those in place and they're very super well managed by by organizations but nrts are the are the keys to connecting people to those diamonds and that's the way we look at nrts they they make the connections they they allow diverse use they allow equitable access to our national trail system by connecting to communities so that when when we're looking for NRTs out there in the world to be to get this designation, we want them, of course, to have this really great following best management practices. But we also really want them to connect um, and and provide equitable access to trails throughout a community. Um, and I think that is what's exciting to me about the NRT system is it's growing you know we get 30 to 10 to 30 new trails every year that can be hyped and designated that way and can be put out there to provide those key connections um, some of the key benefits that that 
um, becoming an NRT has is you, you get on on the NRT database, which which is a searchable database of currently over 1300 trails. Um, so people can go there and find the NRTs in their area and 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 know that they're finding a really high quality trail. Um, the database has been managed for I don't even know how long, um, and we're now um, kind of thinking about how to appify that that process so that people while they're out there or visiting a city they can say hey you know let's look for an NRT in the area and go visit it. Um, one of the one of the benefits too that that's come around is getting free signage for for an NRT if you are a, a newly designated NRT or even if you were designated back in the 70s you can just call us up at, at American Trails and get some signs um, for free that designate it and just kind of give you that that visual stamp of approval in the future um, we've started working with a group called Smart Outdoors that has a has a really unique um, sign program where where you can work with them to get free signs for your trail, whether you're an NRT or not. But I think they're very interested in, in the NRT system, and that they then go after sponsorship for those signs to pay for that, but also send back maintenance dollars to the to the trail that's uh, involved. Um, so that's a pretty cool program that's kind of just being fleshed out right now and, and you can keep an eye out for that in in terms of you know a good focus on the NRTs um, we, we run every year a photo contest and we encourage you all to send in photos of your local NRTs it's a great way to spread the spread the word and we put all those great photos up on our in our database so that people can see what they're getting into when they want to go visit one of your trails and it's also a great resource it's it's on it's on american trails and you can if you want just really 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 pretty trail photos to use in your presentations and things like that that's that's kind of what it's for um, so feel free to download those and give give credit where credit is due but use them to your heart's content um something relatively new a few years ago we started the nrt ambassador program which is over 300 people now and we have people in every state and the idea behind them is we have ambassadors in a region that can kind of take on the nrts and go and to be honest you know some of the ones from the 70s and 80s we don't even know if they still are there so we need people to go out and check on them and see if if the data that's in the database is correct and to connect with land managers, make sure they understand, you know, that they have an NRT, they have one of these diamonds and they should be spreading the word. Um, so we're, we're looking at our ambassadors to kind of go out and visually truth test our trails and then provide support to land managers um, that can, you know, hopefully kind of get a, a an, a cadre of people in the area that can care about their NRT. And as I mentioned already, our, kind of a future plan with this is we're working with app developers to create an app that streamlines ambassador tasks so that they can just go out to a trail with their phone, update the information kind of just in time, take some pictures, give a, give a better directions to the trailhead, that kind of thing. Um, eventually, we want to map all of the trails that are out there, but that's a big task, and that'll be that'll take years and years of ambassador effort to make happen. Uh, but but it is an exciting program, I think. So uh, pass the word if you can about becoming an ambassador and finding folks. One of the less tangible or less understood uh, elements is the opportunity for funding when you're an NRT. Um, while there is currently no direct funding for NRTs, it's like just for NRTs, um, very often in many states, uh, when you apply for a grant for the National Recreational Trails Program, which is funded by the, generally the Department of Transportation in each state and managed by state trail administrators in, in each state, there's often the opportunity to say you're a national recreational trail and that gives you a little bit of a leg up 
in those funding opportunities for two things sometimes it's very obvious like it'll give you more points in their system but that's state by state but also just in your narrative saying you're a national recreation trail kind of gives you that stamp of approval that any funder you know a foundation or a state or a federal funder you know they'll they'll look to that and be like oh yeah that that trail has gone through a rigorous process of of ensuring that they're following good management practices and they're going to be around for a long time. Therefore, I feel safer in providing funding for the needs. Um, and in the future, we, we just actually this year, American Trails launched the Trail Fund and we're, we'd like to fundraise around the idea of having a designated NRT um, program within the trail fund that, that really focuses on providing the maintenance needs of NRTs so that that system as a whole can be more sustainable and more solid moving forward. So we're going to work hard to fundraise around that and keep an eye on the trail fund for those opportunities as well. And next, I think I turn it over to Matt. Thanks, Mike. Couldn't get myself off, off mute there. Um, so yeah, how we become an NRT. Uh, like I said, there's two separate processes. One is basically for Department of Agriculture and Forest Service process. And then basically everything else uh, falls under the Department of Interior process. So if your trail is on federal land administered by the Department of Agriculture, which is typically primarily Forest Service. There's a few other smaller agencies that your trail may be, but if it's a Department of Agriculture trail, the Forest Service has the authority to designate NRTs um, and that designation or that authority rather has been des delegated down to our regional foresters. So we no longer ask the Secretary of Agriculture to sign NRT applications. That can be done by on a region by region basis. Um, but we do work closely with the Washington office to make sure that the application package has everything needed and that the trail is actually worthy of NRT designation. Um, so proposing NRTs on Forest Service lands, um, they're nominated and approved using an internal application. That internal application is also available on the American Trails website. There should be a link to it when you look at the Forest Service application process. Pretty simple form really, um, but it includes the recommendation and approval that's typically done by members of the public or a friends group or something along those lines. Um, we need an accurate trail location description, so usually a good quality map. The trail history um, that tends to provide some context on why it would be a good uh, nomination, nominee for an NRT designation. Um, the trail description and our man management objectives. So that's a little more um, nuts and bolts of, you know, what the trail entails, what the surface type, our manage man that management objectives, like uh, what type of use is the trail open to and things of that nature. Um, any best management practices that the organization nominating the trail may have for uh, maintenance and management of that trail assessment of impacts. And that's just really to get people to think about um, would NRT designation change the nature of the trail and what kind of impacts may be associated with increased use, uh, with increased recognition, things of that nature. And just make sure that that's being taken into consideration on the front end. And it's not something we're trying to fix on the back end after designation. Um, and then a public use statement. Um, just stating that this trail will be open for public use uh, for at least the next 10 years. And I think that pretty much covers the US Forest Service um, application process. I'll pass it back over to Peter to cover the Department of Ag Interior process. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> um, as mentioned, there's two different processes, uh, one for the Department of Agriculture and then a process for everyone else. Um, and so if your trail is on federal state tribal or local lands, anything other than the Forest Service lands. Um, it's been delegated down to uh, the National Park Service on behalf of the Department of Interior to review um, and nominate these trails for designation by the Secretary of Interior. 
So the Department of Interior has the authority to, to designate these NRTs, as I said, on all lands other than the Department of Agriculture. <clears throat> Uh, the application process is a little different as the Forest Service process was a, an internal application system. Uh, the Department of Interior process is actually a, a, a public facing application with some specific criteria. And this slide here just kind of goes over um, some of the questions we ask in the in this public application, also by um, just some some transparent steps that we take uh, to finally get to the, the steps of a uh, designation. So within the application itself, uh, we ask for some basic trail information, you know, name, location, mileage, uh, descriptions, where is it, states, counties, congressional districts, um, all that basic information um, you would need to know about a trail. Uh, contact information, uh, this is usually comes in the form of a, you know, a trail manager or a managing organization, uh, public information contact, um, really anything that the, the public can contact, and we actually use that information as well. Uh, when we're submitting our, our recommendations. Um, number three is very key, uh, owner consent and state support. As we discussed in the trail eligibility section, um, there must be owner consent for any owner consent and support for any of the um, landowners where the trail, trail is on. And again, also, if any of the trail is not on federal land, um, you have to have that letter of support from the respective uh, state trail administrator. Uh, those two things are required if you meet those conditions. Um, some of the other things we ask for, um, a lot of high quality trail photos. Uh, so this could include, you know, those, you know, the trail tread, you know, scenic views along your trail, um, pictures of signage, uh, people of, or pictures of people using the trail. Uh, it really just gives a sense of, you know, what, what's really there on the ground that, that would give um, both our review team and the public um, a sense of how great the trail is. Uh, of course, we ask for a map, um, need to know where the trail is, um, always beneficial. Some additional supporting materials, um, you know, this could be if you wanted to upload your best management plan or um, along with other support materials like letters of support, now, these are different than state and owner consent. These letters of support are more from the, the community members. Uh, so say there's a, a local nonprofit or a local business that, that really just loves this trail. Um, you know, they've, they've seen, let's take a business, for example. Um, you know, this trail brings in a lot of people that go to their bike shop or their running shop, um, and they use this trail. And um, so like those letters of support uh, really help amplify the, the importance of the trail to the public. So those are not required, but they're highly encouraged to really show um, how much the trail means to the community. Uh, finally, there will be a signed signature page, pretty much just confirming um, that you meet all the trail eligibility, uh, you meet all the requirements, and you just sign off. And once you submit all those pieces of information, your application uh, is complete. So then what happens after that? So you must submit all this information by November 1st. That is the deadline for submitting all of these new um, pieces of information. So once that happens, um, as I stated, um, the review process and everything has been delegated to the National Park Service, but we work very closely with interagency staff um, at the Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so those submitted applications, uh, we review them um, by our team on this end. Uh, so that, that review process usually takes about uh, two to three months. Um, during that time, we may reach out with any additional clarifying questions um, if we need, if, if a piece, piece of information is missing or just to clarify to really just make sure that um, the trail and its application are, A, meet all the criteria and are just as great as, it can, as great as they can be. So once the review team has approved an application, uh, we submit a package together, and then we submit that up to the Secretary of Interior for official designation. And just a couple notes here. Um, as I mentioned, the deadline to submit any new applications is November 1st. And something we haven't touched on is National Water Trails. That's a subset of National Recreation Trails. Um, they have a slightly different application process um, that focuses more on best management practices. But we'll actually get to that in the frequently asked questions. Okay, frequently asked questions. So some things um, our program gets 
uh, questions about. Uh, just want to address here. So um, NRTs, they're, they're recognized by the federal government with the consent of any of those landowners that we talked about um, that have jurisdiction over the lands of the NRTs. Uh, there, there has been some questions about um, this landowner consent uh, in regards to adjacent landowners. Uh, this landowner consent, um, as stated in the, in the mandatory criteria and eligibility, um, that consent is for who owns that trail, that piece of land. Um, sometimes there's a there may be an easement on either side of that. So whoever owns that easement, so whoever owns that trail tread um, must provide that letter of consent. Um, all potential trail, trails must apply for the distinction of NRT. Um, you don't just get grandfathered in. Uh, you have to go through, um, you do have to go through this designation process. Um, you cannot use the term National Recreation Trail or use the signage unless you're designated. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, another important thing here is upon designation as an NRT, all management responsibilities remain with the existing land management entity. Um, unless it's on federal land, and of course there's um, you know, management practices set by those different bureaus and agencies, um, there is no federal oversight on the management of any lands other than federal lands and what already exists. Um, so just keep in mind, you know, those management responsibilities remain with the existing land management entity. Um, and finally here, um, we touched briefly on National Water Trails, also known as NWTs, and they are a subset of the National Recreation Trail System, and these are water-based recreation trails. Uh, these were established in uh, 2012 under Secretarial Order 3319 that established that recognized National Water Trails um, as a legitimate category of National Recreation Trails. Um, actually, there will be a webinar next week um, focusing directly on National Water Trails. Um, so if this is of interest to you, you know, feel free to ask questions, but there will be a more thorough discussion of National Water Trails next week with American Trails. Next slide, please. So with all that, um, thank you all for attending um, the first part of our, our webinar here, um, the more federal side and the programmatic side. And with that, we will pass it over to our guest speaker, uh, Andy, who will talk about his experience with National Recreation Trails. Hello, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> I am Andy Griffith. Um, let's see. Anyway, I am uh, a volunteer, mostly directly with the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. Um, which I'm also, by definition, a volunteer for the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. So I've been volunteering at Park River since 2004. And, um, before I moved to Newburyport, uh, I uh, had visited uh, my first spot, which is an NRT. Um, I've been a board member of the Friends of Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. I'm still a member. Um, and a lot of my experience I'm bringing to this talk is basically when I was a member, the big issue was how to uh, replace the uh, Hellcat Interpretive Trail, as it was called then, uh, which was uh, built in the 60s. And because it went out over the water, um, you know, over time there became problems and it became unsafe. So 
there was piecemeal repair going on at the time, but you know, eventually it really needed um, to be replaced and redesigned. Um, not sure uh, when I be when I became a trail ambassador. I thought that was a special program. Um, and uh, let's see, and let me drag the. Um, anyway, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so um, actually, um, in my travels, because um, I like walking trails, um, I looked on the ART map and uh, after a visit in Niagara Falls, um, I found an ART trail, which is the Feeder Canal Towpath Trail in New York, uh, outside of Albany, and it didn't have ambassadors, so I figured, why not? And I was taking pictures there anyway. Uh, there was one other um, NRT that uh, is special for a lot of reasons. It was called the uh, racial cart in, uh, excuse me, it was called the Carson Trail at the uh, racial Carson National Wildlife Refuge in Maine. Um, I became an ambassador of that. Um, I, for the most part, kept maybe not frequently enough, uh, kept the uh, information on the uh, NRT website up to date. Uh, unfortunately, to be honest uh, with this, with this program and preparing for it, um, you know, I did some investigation, this is my nature, and um, through the evaluation of this um, presentation, I found out that uh, the Carson Trail no longer exists, at least uh, what is named that. But I found one that is on the um, ARD, and um, it doesn't have ambassadors. So I'll have to check that out. But has been time lately. I'll check that out soon. <clears throat> anyway, there's uh, some basic information. Um, you know, on the Hellcat Boardwalk Trail. It's all called Boardwalk Trail because it is ART compliant. There are no more, there are not any steps. Uh, in terms of um, resiliency of the boardwalk, it doesn't go over water anymore. And uh, it's, it's very sound in the way it was built with the idea that it goes through wetlands. So water is not totally avoidable, but it's, it's done in, uh, according to present standards, probably even above that. Um, I have a lot, I have a lot of pictures that I've taken uh, on Hellcat. And so I had to select just a few for this talk. Um, but uh, the nice thing about the winter pictures I found is they were um, uh, uploaded from a visitor uh, that I assume that found out about Hellcat from the NRT database. So I thought that pointed out a big advantage and by working, I volunteered at the front desk of the, or the information desk of the uh, Visitor Center for Park River. And we do get a lot of new visitors to the area. We get uh, international visitors. Uh, 
relatively recently at the observation platform on Hellcat, I talked with some folks from Iran. They're now in the United States, but I thought that was very interesting. They were talking a language that I could not understand, so I asked them where they were from. <clears throat> anyway, on down below the title, uh, I put up a URL to a YouTube video that the uh, recently retired uh, business services manager filmed introducing people to the new trail. So I hope everybody in attendance looks at that. It's, it's very good. Uh, and I think, uh, let's see, the slide of the guy, gentleman, on the wheelchair and that might be matt uh, anyway but it shows how the it's now art compliant okay this is the trail i discovered on from the art database and i was very happy i walked up with my wife and now I'm the ambassador. Now, I'm for, fortunately, I have to admit that I haven't been back there since. Um, but also, I think if memory serves me correctly, somebody asked me about why I was the ambassador, but I was kind of hoping that they took it over just because I can't get out there that often. Oh, uh, to go back, if you don't mind, uh, the the interesting that that was not that's not a fish and wildlife service trail. Um, so you know, how did I know about it? But I would imagine that it comes in to what was Mike was talking about in terms of the state trail. I don't know whether that's true, but. Anyway, um, I once in my when I worked for a living, I'm retired now. I worked for Ask.com, and I was in the search operations group. So I got to know specifics about well how Ask does search, did search. I think they search engine is still available um <clears throat> excuse me uh but also they ended up team with google and so i thought why not check and see where hellcake comes out and it comes and uh well there the url is you know how how google determines search order Ooh, I didn't know that that would work. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> okay, and there we have it, uh, that it came up number one. Now, <clears throat> number two is the nonprofit that I founded, Plum Island Outdoors. Sort of a side note, um, the website was actually started when I was on the board of the Friends of Park River National Wildlife Refuge. And the reason it was started on that is to replace what was the existing website for Park, Friends of Park River National Wildlife Refuge. And that came about because um, a gentleman in the Washington, D.C. area um, who had been a refuge manager uh, retired from the Fish and Wildlife Service and formed a company that did a smartphone app that um, 
one of our um, smartphone owned by uh, young adults um, who tend to be on their smartphones um, could could uh, go out and walk a tra walk a trail. And also he was selling not only the Fish and Wildlife Service, but to the national park systems. And basically they could play a game, answer questions, get points through a smartphone, and the, the questions pertain to what they observe. But the problem was it was very expensive and I couldn't get anybody to prove the money. So the uh, refugee manager challenged me to do in something on a website. So I started doing that. That was probably when I came across American Trails. But um, I guess third is sort of a competition. Um, and you notice it still says interpretive trails. So I see the basically a great thing is was pointed out earlier today is about the ambassadors they can go out to the trail and uh, get the nrt database updated which i think is just a great you know great um benefit i'm sorry uh let's see um uh, what, what has gotten important to me very lately is being, being able to um, have the um, people that have impairment, such as wheelchair bound, um, be able to enjoy the great outdoors. And so it's very nice this way. Um, the person on the left of the slide, is, her name is Alice Shepard. She's a person of color, and she knows the impact of racism, and especially when you have um, a disability. And I have, I have met her at, um, a week-long uh, conference uh, in Boston, and she was part of a sub-conference, and I got to talk to her personally. I tried to get her to come out, be able to come out to the Newburyport and have a talk, but there were various problems, one of, one of which is, you know, it's kind of hard. She would have done it over Zoom. Uh, but we see, she, she she does phenomenal dancing you know she considers the wheelchair part of her body and and in just reviewing things for this presentation i found out that there's a video on her website that shows her swing from trees in the outdoors on the wheelchair i thought that was phenomenal and the uh the code that you see, you can put your smartphone on that and you can go to the website and you can learn all about this phenomenal lady. Uh, anyway. Oh, gee, final slide. Okay. How our host, Candace, got to know me is because... Um, I was talking with with the I knew I had to talk with the uh, recently retired in the May. I mean, the um, manager of visitor services, because I feel it's really important to get the water trail as a designated trail. He had a lot to do with it, but I wanted to sort of. I wanted to have a conversation with him before he retired and left so I could get this to get um, the management of the refuge to support this project of mine. 
and so basically you know i at that time the the front picture was this awful set of stairs well <laughs> that doesn't quite do it for um the people i'm really interested in right now so so i wanted to get it updated as soon as possible and and i had forgotten the name of the proper person to send the picture to replacement picture um so i filled out the um contact form and Can candace was right on that thank you very much candace anyway um we have a trail map i went out there yesterday after uh sending one the next last version of this presentation to Candace because I really wanted to get out there because I was thinking a lot about it. So the picture was taken yesterday by my wife that you see in my background and we were on the water trail. Now, this, the coyote was uh, observed by uh, Matt Poole, the retired visitor service manager, used to be a park national park ranger and from the water trail. Uh, the middle co complex, um, Matt had responded just Monday, thanking me for what I did for the refuge on Saturday. And so he thanked me and he, he put the thank you on the um, email I sent to Candace, you know, about getting the picture replaced without the, the new one without the stairs. So he took the time to add his support, at least ver verbally, to have, and that is without knowing all the benefits, of uh, getting the um, water trail designated. So, in the slideshow. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. Really appreciate that. And of course, um, the presentation earlier from Peter, Mike, and Matt. So I'm going to go ahead and just share my question slide here real quick. But um, we don't have a lot of questions still i know peter and matt were actually answering a lot of them behind the scenes um, and i probably will go ahead and go over those um, if we don't get any more uh questions that do come in during the live webinar but um, um william is asking just if you can confirm um and i think this question is for matt when you brought it up earlier can you confirm what what you meant by gaps So the concept being that, you know, the, the trail is complete and without gaps just means that there's not a break in the trail. So you can't designate, let's say, 10 miles of NRT trail um, and you've got a, say, a two mile section in the middle that's not constructed yet. Or say you've got a, a section that goes through a private property and that private property owner does not want to grant permission for that trail or that NRT designation, that would create a gap in the middle. So that's kind of what I was getting at. <clears throat> okay, awesome. Uh, great, Karen's asking, um, they have a trail that was de designated in 2002 when it wasn't fully built out. Does that designation apply to the entire trail? How do we submit GIS data to show the entire trail? Do we happen to know oh, if yeah, that- Peter, yeah. Yeah, I was oh. thinking so. Probably a Peter question. I was going to say, do we know who's responsible for that as a Forest Service trail or is it another? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go ahead and guess that it's not a Forest Service trail, uh, but happy to answer this question. Um, so the the designation only applies to the segment that you apply for. Um, I understand trails extend, change, um, you know, throughout the nature of their lifetime. Um, I was not in this position. 
um, in 2002. Um, but we all had we had the same criteria and in, in everything. So I would imagine that the designation applies just to the section that was built um, at the time. <clears throat> and uh, my next response is actually go to uh, various questions that I see in here. So we are in the process of finalizing a, uh, a National Recreation Trail update form. So if your trail has changed in mileage, still meets all our mandatory criteria, um, if it's been rerouted, if you, if you moved a trailhead, uh, something like that, all the mandatory criteria still exists um, and, and you have been designated. We're working on formalizing a process to document that so that um, the on the ground trails really reflect um, National Recreation Trail status. Uh, so please stay tuned for that. Like I said, we're in the final processes of processes of uh, getting that together. Uh, and we'll do our best to make public information about that once it's finalized. Okay. Can I, can I just add in there that a part of, I think, Karen's question was how to get GIS data to show the trail. Um, you can send that to, to American Trails and we can we're able to add centerline data for trails at, until it's updated the entire, you can send us the entire length if you want, but until it's updated officially, like Peter says, we can't probably add the full GIS data to it, but we can add the portion that's been approved. Um, and I think, you know, Mike at americantrails.org is the best contact for getting that data out there. Mm -hmm. Great, and she did confirm it's not a Forest Service trail. So thank you so much, Karen. Um, Keith is asking, do you have a benchmarking report that identifies what are the best management practices or standards that meet the NRT criteria? Uh, good, Kevin. good question, Keith. Um, so we, we don't have a, a set one in place. Um, it kind of sometimes falls to the reviewers uh, to, and, and they're really um, trail experts. You know, they've been in, in the game for a while with, uh, with building trail, reviewing trail plans, making best management practice plans. Um, so a lot of those reviewers look at, look at the lens with their expertise, um, but best management practices, um, I think a lot of those resources could probably be found on um, American Trails website. Uh, they have they have a slew of information about what makes a good best manager practice. Um, it's it's really up to, you know, depending on the land, um, if it's if it's a new trail, if it's being existed, you know, you need to think about all those um, either ADA or ABA uh, trail standards. Excuse me, just ADA trail standards. Um, so, so you can look into those for some best management practices. You know, the, is it is it being maintained? Uh, is it being built to uh, standards? Is it, um, you know, does it meet all environmental law and compliance? Um, you know, is there a maintenance plan in place? Are people taking care of it? How is that done? Um, really, those those best management practices are a good lens. Um, and if you're if you're curious for something a little bit more specific. Um, and it'll take a little research on your end or everyone's end if you're interested. Um, but you can actually look at the, the National Water Trails application, and they actually have a list of best management practices that, that those trails look for. Um, and so to kind of give you an insight of, of sometimes what we think about with these best management practices, if you wanted to look at that application, um, that could give you uh, kind of a benchmark of, of what to look for as far as BMPs. And all those, all, both of these applications, both NRTs and NWTs are available uh, on American Trails website. Great. Uh, Jeremy is asking, what is the process or what would the process be if a potential national recreation trail is on both uh, USDA and non-USDA lands? That is a great question. Uh, there's some coordination in there. Um, it doesn't happen often. <laughs> Uh, let's start with that. But kind of our general rule of thumb is whoever's got the most trail on their land is the one who's responsible for it. Of course, um, you know, if, if it goes to the Forest Service, there's still going to have to be that coordination with the other land uh, landowners. 
um, that are outside the Forest Service land, um, but that would be you know between the between the two agencies to to resolve that. But at the end of the day, it would end or it would fall to um, whoever has the most trail on that land. Okay. Great. And sometimes um, um, another if that does, oh. if that does occur. Um, you know, sometimes one land management agency, other um, just doesn't want to do it. So the NRT would just kind of end end at the boundary of those respective lands. We've, we've seen that uh, happen uh, mm -hmm. once in my tenure. Mm -hmm. um, Pete has a question. I'm just glad to hear about the emphasis on NRT ground truthing efforts. Um, he is aware of some older NRTs on Forest Service lands, which are definitely not worthy representatives. Can one of the presenters speak to delisting to the delisting process or processes for an existing substandard NRT? Yes, so it's actually a, uh, a very simple process. Um, if a land managing agency or whoever deems that they their trail is not adequate, um, they don't want to be part of the system. It's, it's too much work to to maintain it, build it out. You know, it's, it's falling apart. Uh, we've seen this on on a handful of public land trails where a massive storm comes through or a landslide wipes out wipes out the trail. You know, you're not gonna that trail's closed forever. Um, it's actually a very simple process. If you write to um, American Trails um, and either myself or someone at the Forest Service um, that you no longer want designation, um, we take that as formal formal communication that. It's going to be delisted. Uh, we document that and we pretty much archive it in our files, remove it from the National Recreation Trail database, um, pretty much just remove remove that status from any public information and then keep it for official record. Okay. Um, it seems like, I know, Mike, you might already be answering this, this question behind the scenes from Keith about um, if American Trails monitors volunteer contributed GIS data posted an open street map. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, Candace. I ac actually was trying to answer online, but then I hit answer live, so I just waited. So sorry about that. Oh. But great question, Keith. Um, we, I'm on, I'm on a working group with open street maps right now that's trying to tackle that, that specific issue. So we are involved in kind of monitoring it, and we're trying to figure out the process, you know, along with all trails and uh, Gaia and the federal land management agencies trying to figure out how do we deal with user generated trails or non designated trails when 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 a volunteer just posts uh, a trail on open street map. So it's a complicated process that's currently being worked through. Um, and it's kind of involving a lot of stakeholders. So I'm sure because of that, it'll take a little bit of time, but it is, it can be a really great source of data. And we're, we're figuring out how to best interact with that source of data. Um, and I also wanted to just addressing your other issue, Keith, of, of developing a reference for best management practices. Um, we, we actually are working on that and hoping to have that kind of a part of the application process, uh, probably in 2023, moving on. Um, so that's kind of in the works, just as an FYI. Right. Um, it looks like the other questions may have been answered. There's one kind of a comment that Harold has, um, just in regards to there being over 1300 trails. Um, you know, just thinking about maybe it's time to connect these together um, of all the national recreation trails. You know, one option is provided um, by the American discovery trails concept. Um, and just kind of wondering if you guys have any thoughts. Um, what does American trails think about this concept? He mentions the current American discovery trails routed from Delaware to California, and it uses many of the national recreation trails and other long distance um, bicycle trails. Um, and connect several of the National Scenic and Historic Trails. However, the American Discovery Trails Act in Congress would allow other trails. Do you guys have any comments um, on that? Um, 
Yeah, this is Mike with American Trails. I we love the American Discovery Trail. It's it's got really great. Um, it's really great at at providing some of that connection. We don't have a a, a designated position, I guess, on the on the uh, congressional uh, bill that's that's currently being considered because we don't. I don't feel like American Trails understands, you know, if if a discovery trail category is added to the national trail system, what the ramifications of that are. So we're kind of uh, holding our our thoughts about that until we understand what what the federal land managers that have to deal with, you know, a whole new category, how that would how it, that would um, work in the in the umbrella of the national trail system act but but the american discovery trail is a great example of of like pulling together different types of trails like nrts and local trails and scenic and historic trails all to kind of piece together a route across the country it's a very cool concept mm -hmm. great uh, Rena actually has a question. I see that Peter's starting to answer, but <laughs> just because I know you guys have answered so many of them. How are out-of-state tourists and travelers encouraged to discover these trails? Uh, as we mentioned, uh, one of the benefits is being added to the National Recreation Trail database. So that lists all the 1,300 plus trails um, across the country publicly available. Uh, you can search that database for anywhere you're going. Um, there's all kinds of search functions in there. What, what kind of trail you're looking for? Is it a, a bike trail? Is it equestrian? Um, you can, it ha the database has a bunch of different functionalities that you can look for and you can just search by state. Um, you know, it has a geographic display so you can zoom into an area. Um, so that would probably be the best way to discover any NRT, really. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Natalie up in Canada, um, mentions that they don't have an equivalent of the National Recreation Trail um, of the National Recreation Trails, and at the local level, they are using trail forks as a starting point to create a public-facing map for the users. Uh, do you have any advice or recommendations for creating a public-facing map and/or other mapping efforts to best communicate trail information, connectivity, etiquette, etc.? Um, that's probably me. Um, yeah, American Trails just kind of took took it on um, to try and do some level of mapping, and and it ended up being quite a process. <laughs> I would say <laughs> I don't know that I can go into it. I'd love to talk with you, Natalie, maybe offline about how we how we could you know, it may, maybe inform what we did. I think there's limitations because we found one point along each NRT, largely, you know, through Google Earth um, and trying to find a key trailhead, but that, you know, that has limitations. It doesn't show the full length of the trail. So that's part of the reason we, we thought we needed to engage our ambassadors to try and get centerline data or at least get a download of the centerline data that the land manager may already have and we don't even know about it. So I think there's there's a, a difficult balancing act between on the ground truth truthing and you know just some digging digging in the Google Earth a little bit and finding some information. And I think um, you know, it's not ideal to have one one location on each trail, but at least it's a stepping stone towards better information. And that's, I think, how we approach it currently. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that one a little bit too. You know, she the second part of that is, you know, how to communicate trail information, connectivity, and etiquette. Like, that's a big part of it. And that's one of the things we as federal land managers are struggling with, the trail forks, the uh, Gaia's, all those those third party apps that are being created out there that just want to show you where trails may be. Um, it doesn't necessarily show uh, if the trails open to the public, uh, what kind of uses are allowed on the trail. Um, it just shows the line. So that's a hard question to answer um, as far as showing all of that. And it's something that you know we are working with OpenStreetMaps and some other uh, app developers 
to try and make it possible for land managers to include some of that etiquette and use information, just so that we're relaying accurate information to the users as opposed to just lines on a map. Great. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, we do still have some time. Um, it looks like we've answered uh, it looks like we've answered all the questions so far that have come in. And of course, I will share all of the answer, uh, the Q&A with you guys once, um, once uh, we finalize that and everything. So I'll share that with you guys in a follow-up email as well as add as a resource to the website. So Peter, you can go ahead. Uh, thanks, Candice. Um, I just want to address uh, Pete's question in here. Um, so Pete um, just asked to distinguish what's the difference between a national scenic trail, national historic trail, and a na national recreation trail. Um, I'd be happy to just jump in there real quick for, um, for anyone who may not know. Um, so established under the National Trail System Act um, are three categories of trail, uh, national scenic trail, national historic trail, and national recreation trail. Uh, national scenic and historic trail are congressionally designated while the National Recreation Trails, as we mentioned, are recognized and designated by either Secretary of Agriculture or the Secretary of the Interior. Um, so the biggest thing there is um, how they're designated. So scenic and historic trails uh, take an act of Congress. Uh, there's a lot of, of back end feasibility studies, um, you know, it has to be recommended, uh, has to go through that whole congressional process. Um, and they're usually trails of 100 miles or more uh, that has to have for historic trail, uh, national historical significance um, within American history. Uh, scenic trails have to be nationally significant as well um, and have more of those um, you know, physical land-based elements to address. Um, so the you know, scenic and historic trails, congressionally designated, pretty long process. NRTs, um, you know, these were kind of meant to be more, more streamlined, again, providing that close to home recreation, recognizing the existing trails, um, and those can be recognized by the Secretary of Interior or Agriculture. Great. Stephen has a question um, off the top of your head. Do we know how long the longest National Recreation Trail is? I just looked this Currently. up. <laughs> And it's in Florida. Good I'll tell you that much. It is paddling trail. Just as another plug, I'm going right to the NRT database right now. You can find a, uh, oh. <laughs> a trail. You can enter how long you would want to find a trail. So longest one on record <laughs> is 1,500 miles. The Florida Circumnavigational Saltwater Paddling Trail. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And what about the shortest length of a, in order to be recognized as a, or de designated as a National Recreation Trail? Uh, there, there is no limit on uh, length. Um, I think I've seen some that are any, anywhere from like a mile, mile and a half, just like a, you know, a local, local uh, community trail that's really important you know met all the criteria it's great for the community it brings people together um you know mm -hmm. it's a, sh a short things on like a, a nature preserve or something um uh, within a community but uh yeah no no um limitation on how long a trail can be right um let's see so rena has another question um are, uh, I'm not sure who to ask this um, to, but are there apps being created to make trails, the trails safe and also have phone charging stations to maintain communication while on trail and call for help if needed? Or how else is that done? Not necessarily, I guess, an NRT question, but I'll, I'll jump in you on that one. Okay. So, you know, a lot of going out on a trail, there's some, in theory, some inherent risk, right? You're, you're venturing off uh, the beaten path a little bit to go explore a trail and to get that trail experience. Um, and so being prepared on the front end is really your best way to stay safe. And there are apps out there that are providing information um, about the trail, about the conditions, about um, what to expect on the trail, 
Um, and so having all that information up front is one of your best ways to stay safe on the trail. And then as far as charging stations go, you know, I could see some county parks, state parks, uh, or not state parks, but local municipalities possibly having something along those lines. But in, in general, most land managers aren't going to be adding that type of infrastructure. But, you know, again, speaking to that being prepared up front, if your phone's fully charged when you hit the trail, uh, hopefully it will last the whole distance and other options maybe. Uh, additional battery packs or a little solar charger to keep your phone up and running. Um, but that's not a guarantee either. There's a lot of trails out there that you you give venture out of cert trail service or cell service. Um, so uh, I wouldn't say rely on your phone. It always pays to do your homework up front and try to get a actual paper map when available so that you've got something to fall back on. Great. Steve I, has uh, another great question. Oh yeah, go ahead, Mike. Just to just to Sorry. add on to that, mm -hmm. one of the one of the groups we've started working with, Smart Outdoors. Uh, we I talked about them earlier in terms of providing sign services, but a part of that service is also an app, and and each of the signs has a like a node for on top of it like an electronic i don't know what they call it they should i should probably not be speaking out of turn but it's it's a way to connect and and understand exactly where you are and where the nearest emergency services are i don't think they have any charging capabilities but the those would be more urban areas like matt was talking about you know you can find them in more urban settings but uh difficult to find in in less urban Um, okay, Keith has another great question. Um, if we have considered a trail mentor program for trail managers who have set a goal for attaining NRT or NWT status. Um, yeah, I'd say we've considered it. Um, we have not implemented it. And, and especially recently, it's kind of coming to the fore, like, how can we you know, really, there's there isn't. I guess functionally, there's a bit of a limit to the number of NRTs we can do every year. But we'd love to see 50 NRTs every year, rather than 10. And one key way to do that might be, you know, providing that technical assistance. And I, American Trails does it formally, but it isn't um, or informally. I should say we do it. You can call us; <laughs> we'll help you through the process. We'll answer your questions. We'll tell you, you know, what, you know, what your trail needs to do to, to have a leg up in, in getting the designation. And so will Peter, actually. I mean, it's not a, it's not mm -hmm. a hidden thing. We'll do everything we can to help you out. Um, but we would love to formalize that mentor program and formalize the benefits as well. And that may be something down the road that we're considering. Right. And Mike, when you say it, that best practices um, document for NRTs might also help that without having to yeah. have a full on mentor, just when that document's ready, you're sort of the guide. Right. That's mm -hmm. a good point. Right. Um, something also to keep in mind <clears throat> uh, if you're thinking about applying, you can find all the application questions ahead of time. Um, it's certainly not a black box. Um, again, you can find it on American Trails website. Um, so if you are thinking about this, you know, it'll lay out what all the questions are, um, you know, all the mandatory criteria we talked about, you know, all the mandatory documents you're going to need. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're planning to apply on November 1st, you know, we're doing this webinar early, um, you know, to give people time, but mm -hmm. all the information on what we need is transparent out there. Um, so again, if you are thinking about applying, all that information is right there at your fingertips. And again, Mike, Matt, and myself, with our Respective, respective trails um, are always there to, to answer questions. Great. Uh, well, I think that about sums up the Q and A. Um, I guess just M Matt, you know, Mike and Peter, do you guys or Andy, do you guys have any last thoughts or words that you wanted to share? I just wanted to throw out something that I I forgot to mention when I was talking about the Forest Service application. So the 
Department of Interior process is a little more formalized than the Department of Agriculture process is. And we don't have that November 1st deadline. Um, you can really apply any time of year. We do ask that you apply by November 1st if you wanna be included in the news releases and the press uh, that comes out right before National Trails Day relating to new NRTs, but our process doesn't have that hard deadline. Good point. Anyone else? <laughs> just following, following up on that, like if, if you do apply for, on the Department of Interior side, um, again, that, that review period is not a black box. Um, if we see something, um, you know, you applied, but there's like a little bit more work to do or you're missing a document or, or something, we will certainly follow up with you um, on that. It's not, you know, the, the channels of communication mm -hmm. are, are there up until, you know, the final applications are approved. And that's usually uh, the beginning of March. So that gives November through February to, to really work, work with applicants. Um, if, there, if there's any changes we would need for additional resources. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you again to all of the presenters and to all of the attendees interested in this very important topic. Uh, the slide that you see on your screen right now, it will be emailed to everyone. Uh, along with the link to the recording and the transcript and all of their names are, are linked to the presenter emails if you want to follow up. And you can also email us American Trails at NRT at americantrails.org and we'll help answer your question or direct you to the right person to answer, uh, to answer your question um, now or later on in the process if you guys, are, again, are interested in um, getting designated as a National Recreation Trail. So I also um, then want to thank our, our partners again of the webinar, which include all, all of our presenters um, with, with the National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service, obviously American Trails, the Bureau of Land Management, and uh, the Federal Highway Administration. And if you are enjoying these webinars, um, I just ask you to please consider donating as little as $5 by texting I'm for Trails to 44321. Your donation will go to the Trail Fund, which um, Mike had briefly mentioned um, during his presentation. Um, it's a new grant program American Trail of American Trails that we held our inaugural um, grant process this year. And so the deadline for applications um, for 2022 um, has passed, but we are working hard for more funding um, for 2023 uh, to offer more grants next year. And I will select a couple people who donated immediately following the webinar to receive um, our uh, Trail Boss mug as a thank you. And uh, we hope you'll join us for these upcoming webinars noted on your slide. If, as Peter mentioned, we do have a webinar specifically on the National Water Trails taking place next week. And as usual, all of our webinars are free and also include free learning credits. So I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day and happy trails. Thanks again.